Welcome to Together in MS, Supporting Family and Friends of People with MS. This webinar and tele-learning series is brought to you by Kendu Multiple Sclerosis and the National Multiple Sclerosis Society as part of our monthly series. My name is Laura Coyne, the Programs Manager for Kendu MS. I will be your moderator this evening. Kendu MS transforms lives. We deliver educational programs on exercise, nutrition, and symptom management to inspire and motivate long-lasting change for those with MS and their families to help them thrive. Please visit Kendu at the Kendu MS website, mskendu.org, to learn more about Kendu MS's online and nationwide in-person programs. Kendu MS is excited to partner with the National MS Society to bring you 15 webinars in 2016. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other society programs, services, resources, and connection opportunities at nationalms.org. We will save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions and answers. If you do have a question, please post them in the chat feature located on the left of your computer screen. To submit a question, type in the small box that says chat with presenters. I would like to encourage you to be part of this interactive discussion. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on Kendu MS's and the National MS Society's websites. Because this is being recorded, all telephone lines have been muted. With us tonight to look at ways that support partners can take care of their own wellness while providing care and support to a partner is a psychologist, Rosalind Kalb, and a physical therapist, Mandy Rorg. Mandy Rorg is employed by at Horizon Rehabilitation Centers, an outpatient physical therapy clinic where she specializes in the rehabilitation of individuals with neurological conditions with a special emphasis in the treatment of individuals with multiple sclerosis. Roz Kalb is Vice President of Clinical Care at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, where she develops and provides educational materials, clinical tools, and consultation services for healthcare professionals. At this time, I would like to introduce Roz Kalb. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you've joined us all tonight. Um, and I want to invite all of you in the audience meaning that all of you out there are partners with one another. What that means is that you are dealing with MS in partnership. Many of you live together, and therefore you live with MS together, because make no mistake about it, when one person in a family is diagnosed with MS, everyone in the family lives with the disease as well. As partners, you care for and support each other, and we're going to talk tonight about ways to make sure that that caring relationship is balanced and healthy in the way you want it to be. You also share in decision making about how to manage the disease, how to live with it in the best possible way you can, um, and how to plan your future together. And we hope that you share a commitment to wellness uh, for yourself, and for each other, because that's what partners do. Now in this webinar, we're going to talk about how each of you can optimize your wellness, but we're going to focus in particular tonight on wellness for support partners and how those of you living with MS can really help your support partners achieve wellness for themselves um, so that they can be healthy and well um, and also provide the best possible support and care for you who are living with MS. So what do we mean when we say wellness? It's a word that we use a lot um, these days, and it gets a lot of attention in the media. So for tonight, what our definition is, um, is that wellness is a lifelong journey through which people, all of us, make positive choices about our behaviors, our lifestyle, and our activities that enable us to thrive. We want our wellness 
activities to help us live the best lives that we possibly can. And one of the key messages is that whether you're a person living with MS on this call or you're a support partner for someone you love who has MS, you both can achieve wellness. So Mandy, can you talk us through what some of the domains of wellness are? Yes. Thank you, Roz. Welcome, everyone. There are six primary domains of wellness. And of these six, the four which are highlighted in kind of that green shade are the four that we're going to discuss at greater depth. But let's briefly touch on these six domains. So the first one is our physical health, which primarily entails diet and exercise. The second aspect is your emotional well-being or your mental health. The third one, spirituality, which is often thought to be that, that state of being mindful or being present, but it can also mean a relationship with religion as well. Cognitive health, so your mental health, meaning like your memory, your ability to multitask, learning capacity, that executive uh, function, cognitive function. Work and home is really referencing your access to home and work and optimizing your life and your abilities in those areas. And then lastly, relationships. So these are the caring for, maintaining, and enjoying those relationships with people that you have at work, at home, and even within the community. So in the spirit of the fall season, we've found a correlation between wellness and all of these domains and the beauty of a tree. So optimizing wellness and achieving wellness requires strategy and nurturing, just as growing trees and growing a garden will, would also require. And just as we're starting to enjoy the beauty and the balance of the fall colors, we also can be reminded of the balance ne necessary to achieve wellness. So you and your partner can help one another keep your tree or your wellness balanced. Even a strong, well-balanced tree has experienced and will continue to experience some challenges. So let's move on and talk a little bit about some of the challenges, just like you have an MS, that may exist um, and may be a barrier to wellness. So Roz, can you give us an idea why wellness is so hard and so difficult to achieve? What are some of those barriers? Sure. Now some of these barriers uh, apply to all of us, and some of them, as you'll see, here, are specific to support partners because, again, we really want to focus in on wellness for support partners. But any of us can feel like we simply have too much to do, too much on our plate, and too little time to deal with a self-care activity that can help us achieve wellness in our own lives. Sometimes, particularly support partners will say at the end of a day, given their activities at work, their activities at home, and maybe extra activities they've taken on to support their loved one with MS, they'll say, I just don't have any energy left. And of course, since people with MS so often live with fatigue, they can certainly relate to that feeling of just having no energy left to focus in on oneself. Support partners often say, well, I'm really focused on taking care of my partner with MS. That's what's most important. That's what I want to do, and, and I just don't want to be focusing on myself right now. I'm doing fine. I need to focus on my partner. And if I focus on myself when my partner is living with MS, I feel selfish. I don't feel good about myself. So sometimes support partners really don't feel they have the right to um, take the time out to take care of their own wellness. And any of you on the call can sometimes feel, I'm just trying to get through the day. The days are hard enough and I can, if I can just get through from morning to night and do all the things that are on my plate, well then I, that's enough. And taking on wellness just doesn't work. So. Let's do a first poll, and this poll is for support partners out there. So all of you who are support partners, please indicate which of these barriers tends to be the biggest one for you. What holds you back from focusing on, on your wellness?
Okay, we're going to tally the results. And, well, it's interesting. Okay. Fairly well balanced, huh, Roz? Yes, they're remarkably balanced. Uh, let's see. I think too little time and too little energy seem to be uh, kind of taking over, but if we sit here long enough, the, the answers may change. Too little time is clearly winning the race. Okay, thanks very much. So let's assume that, that we acknowledge that wellness is a goal, that it's important for all of us, but there's not a lot of time to do it or not a lot of energy. But I still think that it's good to start someplace. You're not going to be able to do it all at once. You're not going to be able to change everything in your life um, at one time. So we focus tonight on um, a few areas that we think will be particularly helpful to you, and we'll talk more about them as we go through the webinar. Tending to your physical health is important for all of us, whether we are a support partner, have MS, or are just um, other people in the world. We all have to take care of our physical health so that we're in the best shape that we can possibly be. Similarly, we all owe it to ourselves to pay attention to our mood and to take care of our emotional well-being because we're, when we're emotionally in good shape, that gives us the more of the energy that we need to attend to other parts of our life. And we want to strive for balance. All of us in this complicated day-to-day -day world that we live in have demands at home, at work, uh, with other relationships and friendships, and we want to make sure that we're giving all of those priorities the attention that they need at the same time that we're saving some time and energy to attend to our own needs. So striving for balance is a major step in achieving wellness. And we want to make sure that partnerships are two-way streets. Although some of you on this call live with MS and some of you are support partners for a loved one with MS, true partnerships are a give and take where both people in the partnership give and receive. And so working on making your partnership a two-way street is an important part of working toward your wellness. Thanks, Roz. Andy, can you talk to us about how to set goals? Yeah. So a good place to start and to start thinking about as we continue on discussing more of these domains of wellness is how can we use this information and move forward. So we want to introduce the concept of SMART goals to everyone. So Setting SMART goals are one way to help achieve goals around wellness. And goals that are SMART should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So I think this concept is best illustrated through examples. So an example of a goal that is not a SMART goal would be, I will lose weight. Clearly this goal is, is not measurable. It's not specific and certainly not suggestive of any sort of time frame. So this lack of clarity and unspecificity may make it really difficult to strive for and certainly even more difficult to know when that goal has been achieved. So an example of a good SMART goal along the same lines would be, I will lose 10 pounds in the next two months to help improve my diabetes. This goal is specific and measurable in the amount of weight that will be lost. It is an attainable goal as a weight loss of 1 to 2 pounds a week is really reasonable and realistic. It is re a relevant goal as maintaining a healthy weight may help influence type 2, type 2 diabetes. And lastly, it is a timely goal. The intention of the goal is to be achieved within two, in two months. So again, as we kind of continue and discuss further these domains of wellness, we encourage you to start thinking about how you can take action, how you can start setting some SMART goals for yourself. So that being said, Roz, let's go ahead and dive into physical health. Tell us a little bit about that. So physical health is, again, as I said before, something that we all need to strive for. 
starting with the preventive health care that's recommended for all of us, depending on our gender and our age, seeing a primary care physician, getting the uh, recommended screening tests, and just making sure that we're staying on top of um, our health. Stopping smoking, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but stopping smoking is a goal that any of us, with or without the mask, um, should be working towards. We also want to eat in a healthy way because that helps to support our overall health. That's both physical activity and regular exercise. And again, these physical health um, uh, activities pertain to people with MS as well as support partners of people with MS. Uh, participating in recreation and enjoyable activities um, that give you pleasure in your life and allow you to enjoy things by yourself and also with um, people that you love. And for support partners, we also are going to talk tonight about how to ensure your personal safety, your physical safety when you're engaging in caregiving activities for the person you love. So let's go into a little more detail about each of these. So for families health care, again, it's important that you check to find out um, what is recommended for you depending on your age and your gender and ensure that you keep up with those. Um, support partners in particular um, will tend to neglect these sometimes because they feel they don't have time to go to the doctor or they are the one who's healthy and they need to focus on the health of their loved one with MS. So people often neglect this self-care. Stopping smoking is critically important. We've known for a long time that stopping smoking is good for your personal health, um, anybody, whether you have MS or not. But we now know that um, when people stop smoking, that is good not only for themselves, but for their loved one with MS. The reason that is true is because recent data now shows that smoking, whether a person with MS does it personally or is surrounded by secondhand smoke, that smoke uh, makes the disease process progress more quickly um, with worse outcomes. And when people with MS stop smoking or when the people around them stop smoking, that leads to an improvement in their MS and a slowing of disease progression. So it's never too late to stop. So for those of you who are support partners, stopping smoking not only does great things for your own health, but for your loved one with MS as well. And healthy eating um, is obviously important for our good health. We know that eating a healthy, balanced diet helps to maintain weight uh, at, a, at a healthy level. It helps to reduce other health problems, which can uh, lead to sickness and shorten life. And when you eat healthy as a support partner, you're also supporting your partner's healthy eating. So this is one of the great things that partners can do together to help each other maintain um, a good, balanced diet that's good for your health. So let's do a poll. Okay, support partners, this one's directed towards you. Have you seen your primary care provider in the last year? We'll wait a bit and let the responses come in. I was just going to add to Roz's comments about nutrition on the previous slide. I believe CanDo has some really lovely archived webinars about nutrition. So if you're wanting to pursue that particular area of wellness in greater depth and kind of want a place to start, I would encourage you to reference some of those archived um, webinars about nutrition. And I think we've got all our responses in. We'll see what. So we, this is wonderful. 
This is wonderful. I would say the vast majority of our participants and support partners, I would say, excuse me, support partners have seen a primary care provider. Wonderful. That's great news. Congratulations, everybody. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk a little bit more about physical activity. This slide is really directed more towards support partners, so physical activity on your own. So what I want to start with is it's important for support partners to participate in physical activity on their own if they so choose. And to give yourself permission to do that independently. And just be certain you communicate that to, to your loved one who has MS. So a support partner who wants to embark on a physical activity regimen should consider these, these four areas, uh, aerobic exercise, strength training, flexibility, and, and then lastly, balance and coordination. The um, kind of the governing body for exercise recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise a week. It recommends two days a week of strength training at a minimum of 8 to 12 repetitions, one set for each muscle group. Flexibility exercises two to three times a week, holding each stretch maybe 30 seconds or so, repeating a couple times. And lastly, balance exercises should be completed two to three times a week for a total of about 20 minutes. So I'm guessing most of you support partners out there are thinking, yeah, right. When will I find the time to do, to do all of that recommended physical activity when my time is so limited already? So that, that leads me to the next point. Finding time is always a challenge in the presence of MS and, or not in the presence of MS. It's just incredibly difficult to manage that time. And MS can complicate it because the time that you would perhaps dedicate to exercise or any free time that you may have is most likely used for caregiving, appointments, or other family obligations. So clearly, and, and unfortunately, I can't create more hours in the day for you, although I wish I, wish I could. Um, I want to give you just three simple tips to kind of consider about how to manage manage your time to allow a little bit of exercise in, in your life. So number one is designate the same time every day. Book it like you would book an appointment. Schedule it in. It should be a priority to you. And make it a priority to your partner. Articulate that to your partner that this is something really important to me that I can achieve. And work together. Work together to make it happen. Help and encourage one another to make that, that time, preserve that time for you. Secondly, a tip that may work for you is to sprinkle it through the day. The research in the world of exercise and fitness says it's perfectly fine to sprinkle your exercise through the day and that intermittent activity is just as effective for your overall health. So devices maybe like Fitbits or pedometers or some of those activity, those wearable activity monitoring devices can be helpful to kind of encourage you and keep you motivated to, to move throughout the day. And lastly, I think this might be the most important tip for fitting exercise in with limited time is to communicate it. Communicate your needs to your partner. Let them know. Let them know that you need this time preserved for you, um, not only for your body, but also for your mind and for your spirit. And I'm most certain that most, most people living with MS would be willing to help, help you achieve that goal. My last point I want to bring up is access. So, Sometimes people think that they need to have a gym membership in order to be in good physical health, but I can assure you that uh, quality physical health is not equal to how much time or money you spend at a gym. So that being said, while gyms are great, they certainly are not the only option. There are plenty of ways to exercise on your own at home. I hope this picture isn't showing what your home exercise bike would look like. But there are many exercises that you can do at home, perhaps uh, videos, using stairs for aerobic exercise, cans for strength training, using your own body resistance. My best advice truly for support partners would be to schedule a time with a physical therapist, maybe um, most importantly a physical therapist who understands MS. Um, and if you need some help figuring out the exercise routine that's best for you, engage that PT because they will understand what it's like to the challenges of MS and what it's like to live with MS. 
so the tips and the advice and the problem solving that you can do together will most likely have a greater success. But don't, don't hesitate to use, um, use someone. Use those rehab professionals to help guide you on your exercise decisions. So now we've talked a little bit about physical activity that the support person can do independently. But there is physical activity that you can do together. And even though you may be at different physical ability levels, there are still certain activities you can do together if you so do choose. Um, now that being said, the images that you see here, we're not endorsing any of these products. I'm just using them as an example so you can uh, get a visual of what we're, what we're referencing in the conversation. So again, there are times when exercising together is ideal, and there are times that you will wish to be on your own. And again, either is acceptable. Just be certain to communicate that with your partner so that it's mutually understood. So this first picture up here in the left, upper left-hand corner right here, I'll draw a little line, is a recumbent tandem bike. And bikes are, bikes are just so beautifully adaptable. You can get power assist features so you don't have to pedal as hard. You can get hand cycles. There are just many, many options for many, many um, ability levels. So if you're something that you want to do with your, your partner, I would really encourage considering cycling. Secondly is a scooter. And many of you are probably thinking, what on earth would a scooter, how does that involve physical activity? Well, scooters, and sometimes power mobility such as power wheelchairs are really looked down upon. And I think people feel like they're, they're giving in or they're losing to the disease when they choose to use one of these devices. But I would really, really encourage you to rethink that. I would really encourage you to think of it more as a tool and what can be gained by using that scooter or what can be gained by using that power wheelchair. Maybe you and your support partner Maybe the two of you can go together on a walk for a long walk and have this lovely, really engaging, wonderful conversation and push your support partner rather than going on a short, you know, unstable, off-balance walk where you need to perhaps lean on your partner um, or fatigue just becomes overwhelming that you can't, can't walk further or walk longer safely. So that scooter might be that tool to allow the two of you to really have some quality time together while at the same time allowing the support partner you the chance to, to get some good exercise. This one is sit skiing, that one in the lower left-hand corner, these folks right here. And actually our founder, Jimmy Hugo, was a big fan of sit skiing. So the person with MS is sitting on the skis, and then the support partner would be behind. You guys both get to enjoy the slopes together, enjoy the outdoors, and enjoy skiing. And the one here on the lower right-hand corner is adaptive rowing. Rowing again is nice because you would be able to rest. The person with MS would be able to rest when needed or participate when able. Um, again, something you can enjoy together. Um, and just another option. Um, Adaptive rowing also has these nice pontoons on the sides so that if you get a little off balance, you, that, it's going to be less likely because that will improve, improve that balance. So let's talk a little bit. Now that, now that we got you thinking about moving more for exercise and moving together, how can we keep you moving safely? So this isn't just for exercise, but this is for daily functional activity as well. So, I want to just bring up two primary devices that I think are pretty key to helping people be successful with um, supporting their loved one with MS. So gate belts and sliding boards. So the first one we're going to talk about excuse me, are gate belts. So what gate belts are is they are a device that wraps around the waist and they are used to help with walking, transferring, or even just if someone's a little bit off balance with some of their mobility. It goes around the waist like I mentioned. This particular one has handles on the sides, buckles in the front, and then there, you can't see it, but there's another handle in the back. So it gives the support partner a variety of places to hold on to. We strongly encourage using gate belts versus holding arms or holding any other body parts. <laughs> we just really encourage people to use belts. It's safer and um, 
it protects the person, the support person as well. And this other belt over here is a little bit more of a uh, traditional belt, and other than that, it still buckles in the front and does the same does the same job. If you don't have access to either one of these, a traditional belt that you would use on your on your britches would do do just the same. The next one is a sliding board, and this is an image of the sliding board right here. And the purpose of sliding boards are they allow the person with MS to kind of scoot safely from one surface to the next during a transfer. It may be a device that allows the person with MS to be more independent with a transfer while also kind of minimizing the burden that the support partner may have. It protects their body from maybe the wear and tear of a lot of transfers. So you know, in, in all reality, everyone wins. The person with MS has some more independence, and the, person, the support partner um, has an opportunity to, to rest their body a little bit. And lastly, I want to comment just briefly about lifting body mechanics, and then we'll talk a little bit more on the next page together. So three principles, simple principles I just want to, to highlight. The first one is to have a large base of support. So as a support person, it's important that you get your feet nice and wide so that you have sufficient balance and that you're sturdy to assist with a transfer. Secondly, the support person should try to hold that person with MS near to their body or close to their own center of gravity because it's much easier to lift an object or a person when they're near your center of gravity versus farther away. And then the last tip I would give you about body mechanics and lifting would be to just simply communicate. Establish a routine um, how you're going to do transfers. The support person should communicate what they're going to do before they're going to do it. An example would be maybe you and your support partner decide to, on the count of three, you go one, two, three, and then go ahead and lift after that. Again, just establishing some type of, of routine or some type of way of communicating what's going to happen when it's going to happen. And lastly, I would just, as, as a side comment, I think it's important to communicate when to help, meaning have the person with MS articulate when they need help, and have the person with the support partner, as long as it's safe, respect that, that, that wish. There will be plenty of opportunities for the support person to help, <laughs> and there will be plenty of opportunities in the future for them to do so. So empower and engage and use those tools to continue to allow that person with MS to be independent as possible. Okay, just a few more tips and tricks when it comes to physical, the physical wellness piece. So I want to show you a few images that are in action, and I hope these are, are fairly clear for your slides. Um, specifically, proper use of the de these devices. So they're certainly not the full scope of their use, so please, please, please consult with a PT if you feel like maybe there's a possibility that you might benefit from some of these tools, or maybe you're scratching your head now and thinking, well, I wonder if I'm using this one right. Or, if you have any question, I would just strongly encourage you to go ahead and con consult with your, with your rehab professional. So this first diagram here on the left is a step-by-step -step, step -step sequence of a pivot transfer. Okay? So generally speaking, when you transfer, transfer to the strong side, put on the gate belt, have the person with MS scooch as far forward whether it be the wheelchair or whatever surface they're transferring from, the car, car seat chair, wherever. Um, have them scooch to the edge. The second step is the person who is supporting the person with MS will block the knees. It may be necessary in some circumstances if there's a lot of spasticity or tightness in the legs, but sometimes it may not be necessary. Now, my only criticism is, this isn't, this isn't holding the person very close to the center of mass, so don't take this diagram quite too seriously. Um, so I would encourage that person to pull them a little bit closer, a little more safely, a little more support for that person who's being transferred. And then pull, stand, and then pivot to the other surface. Again, it's ideal to, I should mention, to position the person with MS parallel to the transferring surface. So in other words, if you are transferring from a wheelchair to say another chair, pull that wheelchair parallel up to, the, up to that other surface. 
Okay. So the, I have a other question for you, Mandy. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what part of, of the body is a support person really trying to protect? I mean, when are, what, what injuries do support partners encounter most often because they don't use the right tools or don't know the proper body techniques for doing transfers? Wonderful question. Thank you for bringing that up. So we see a number of lower back injuries. I would say ugh, too many that I want than I would prefer to count. So bending with the knees, bending at the hips, almost like you're squatting down um, to sit down in a chair yourself. That should be the position that you want to be in when you're bending to help lift a person. Out of, a, out of a wheelchair. You should truly feel it in your legs. You should not feel it in your back. And if you do feel it in your back, then that would be something that you would have to get some additional guidance on your technique. And actually, what I have a client that, right now. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I have a client right now who's, um, she's, uh, uses a wheelchair for her mobility, and she, her and her husband did have some difficulties with transfers, and he is now also a client of mine <laughs> being treated for a low back injury. injury. So it, it is very critical to keep, keep your, your technique in mind for protecting yourself and, now, and for protecting your loved one as well. So the, what I was going to ask you, Mandy, was you know, sometimes if you, a person with MS is being assisted to, to stand, their natural reaction might be to put their arms around their support partner's neck um, for stability. But yeah. I assume that you don't really recommend that as a safe thing to do? Great question. So we, we can show our support partners love, but that is not the way we want to show them love is during a transfer. What I recommend if the person is able is to put their arms around their waist or they can leave them at their sides. But definitely, I would agree, not around, not around the neck. Because yep. that could cause neck injury? I mean, is that the reason? Absolutely. If you would slip, you would fall, you could definitely pull or strain the muscles of the neck for the person, um, the support person. Yep. Absolutely. I think the bottom line is with transfers, you want them to do them as safely and as efficiently as possible. Um, it's not a time to be fancy. It's not a time to try too many things out of the ordinary. Just make sure it's done safely. Make sure it's done strategically. Mm -hmm. Great points, Roz. Thank you. Uh, lastly, I'll just point out these last two pictures, and then we'll move on to some um, comments about emotional well-being. Uh, the gals demonstrating the use of a sliding board, and this gal is actually this particular support partner is doing a great job of showing how you use your knees, bending at the knees and the hips to help with the lift. And then this person would scooch and slide across to the mat. Um, when you're using a gait belt, we encourage people to stand to the side and to the back when you're helping someone with walking with a gait belt. Don't walk directly beside them. You could get tangled up in any type of an assisted device or even their feet. So it's best to stand kind of to the side and to the back. Okay. Now that we have an idea of how to kind of encourage our physical health for both the person with MS and the support partner, Roz, how can we improve our emotional health? Let's see if I can get. Okay, so I want to focus here um, specifically on support partners because I think we have the support groups and self-help groups for people with MS. We have all kinds of engagement opportunities. Um, but we sometimes forget that support partners have a lot of emotional needs as well, and they often aren't asked how are, how are they doing, how are they feeling, what are they worried about, what's on their minds. Um, one of the opportunities I have at a lot of uh, can do programs is spending time with support partners, and it's it's amazing how often um, I will hear from support partners that they're never really asked. Um, how how they're doing or feeling because um, everybody is so focused on the needs of the person with MS. So I'm here to encourage all of you support partners on this call to really think about how you're doing emotionally. Um, do you have your own support network? Um, people that you can turn to when you need to talk or get support or get encouragement because sometimes we all need 
uh, that kind of support maybe outside our, our family, but sometimes it's with a mental health professional, sometimes it's just with a group of friends, but, uh, or colleagues at work, but it's a support network that you feel that you can count on and turn to when you need that extra bit of support. There's nothing selfish about recognizing your own needs when we take care of ourselves. Uh, that is being self-sustaining. It is uh, nourishing our own uh, needs and well-being. And so taking time to think about what you need um, in your life to feel emotionally well, uh, is, is a, it's a responsibility. It's not um, something that you need to feel selfish about doing. You need to pay attention to your mood. We know that um, uh, support partners, not just in MS, support partners as people with any kind of chronic illness can be at greater risk for depression and anxiety and other mood changes. And you may not be asked about your mood, but you need to notice if your mood has changed suddenly or if you're feeling down um, or sad or discouraged all day, every day for um, a, 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 you know, more than a few days at a time or you've lost interest in things that used to give you pleasure um, and satisfaction in your life. Those are signs of depression and support partners, again, are, um, are at risk of depression just as people with MS are. So paying attention to, to your mood and reporting um, significant changes in your mood to your health care provider is the first step to getting the help that you need. You also need to pay attention to your stress level. Uh, there are a lot of demands in your life. You're being pulled in a lot of different directions. And sometimes that stress can just feel overwhelming. And again, uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, I need some help. I need to learn strategies for how to manage stress in my life and maybe get rid of some stresses that, that um, I don't need to have. Um, and this is a time when, when talking to a, a counselor, a mental health professional can be particularly helpful. And sometimes it's just a good strategy to sit with an unbiased, disinterested professional person who can walk you through what are those stresses and strains in your life and how can you figure out uh, how to prioritize them and how to maybe get rid of some that you don't need and learn how to manage the ones that are unavoidable. Um, if you want to reach out for some professional help, um, there's no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed about doing that. It's a sign of strength to reach out for help. So I encourage you to do that. You can ask your primary care physician for a referral to a counselor or mental health professional in your area. You can also call one of the society's MS navigators. They're there to help you as much as they're there to help um, your loved one with MS. So all you need to do is call this number on the slide, um, explain that you're a family member, um, and that you would like a referral to a mental health professional in your area, and they will be glad to help you um, find somebody that you can get to in your community. When we take care of our own emotional needs and we find um, how to prioritize the things in our life and balance them, that's a sign of health. Again, it's not selfish. It's really self-sustaining. You cannot be an effective support partner or loved one for somebody else if you're not paying attention to your own needs. Um, in the same way that the flight attendant says to every one of us when we get on an airplane, you know, if there's a drop of air pressure in the cabin, an oxygen mask will come down and you put on your own first before you help anyone near you. So the same thing is true in life. If we don't pay attention to our own health and well-being, we can't be as good a support to anybody else. So finding balance in your life is all about juggling your roles and commitments in an effective way. So I want to give you a little exercise that you can try tonight, but you can also do it periodically in your lives. I would encourage each of you, support partners and people living with MS, to take out a piece of paper, do it separately, don't show each other your drawing, 
and draw a circle on that piece of paper, just like a pie. And ask yourself, how much of your life space is taken up by MS? And your answer may change from week to week, month to month, or year to year. But it may also be different from each other. And it's a very helpful conversation to have, to share your drawings and talk about how to get balance in your life so that MF is getting the attention it needs, but it's not getting more attention than it needs, and that other aspects of your lives um, are as fulfilling and busy as you want them to be. So with that, we're going to turn to our next poll. Mandy? Okay. So this one is directed to our people living with MS. How big of a piece is your pie? How big of I'm sorry, how big of a piece of your pie is your MS? So how much of your life is consumed by MS? Again, we'll wait a bit. And we realize, like Roz commented on, we realize that changes. And, and it should, it will likely continue to change in different ways. So it looks like about, again, pretty balanced with the majority of folks anywhere between one quarter to three quarters. Roz, do you have any comments? Um, only that um, it is balanced and it's important to think about how MS takes up that space in your life and if there's anything that you could be doing that might change that feeling for you. Great. Okay, now this, qu this polling question is directed to our support partners who are participating. How big of a piece of your pie is MS? Okay. Give you just a bit longer. Majority of folks, it appears like it's around a quarter to a half. Okay. So again, it's a it's a good exercise to do this periodically. Each of you. Um, on your own sheet of paper, and then compare and talk about it. See if it feels um, as balanced as it should be, as it feels out of if it feels out of whack. I'll share one um, one brief story. We we did this at a at a recent in person program, um, and one of the women with MS, when she saw her husband's drawing. She said, this was one of the best things I've ever done because I've been feeling so guilty and so worried that my MS is ruining his life. And then he drew his pie and it was actually only a quarter or less. She said, so that was a great relief for me. Um, I don't have to feel so guilty anymore because he's not feeling as overwhelmed by my MS as I worried he was. So that kind of conversation was very helpful for them. So I do encourage you to try this exercise together and repeat it every couple of months or so and see how things change or stay the same. And it's a good excuse to have a slice of pie while you complete your pies, right Roz? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> good deal. So I mentioned before um, how important uh, it is to take a look at your relationship and make sure that it's balanced in the way you want it to be. Um, all of us need to feel as though we give in a relationship and receive in one. Um, nobody feels good when that 
balance gets out of whack. If it starts to feel as though one person is having to do more and more um, of the activities around the house or in managing the household or just taking care of the relationship, um, neither person feels good, right? It's overwhelming for the person who's taken on so much, but it doesn't feel good for the, for the one who's had to give up um, so much of his or her roles in the family. So when a partnership starts to feel out of whack or unbalanced, that's a good time to sit down and talk about how you might adapt your roles a little bit in ways that can sustain balance. So for example, if a person um, with MS has had to give up some of the activities at home that he or she always used to do in the past, perhaps there's something that could be traded. Um, maybe if it's no longer possible to do the cleaning around the house, it might be possible to take on more of the uh, things like bill paying or activities that don't require so much physical activity. Some of those pesky phone calls we always have to make for repairs, things like that. So think about ways that you can swap so that each person feels like a contributor to the relationship that will help you sustain balance, which also helps to sustain that partnership over the long haul. Um, this webinar has been a lot about um, wellness strategies for the support partner because we feel that so often the needs of support partners don't get enough attention. And so one of the things I think that Mandy mentioned before is that it's important for those of you who live with MS to think about how you can support your partner's efforts to take care of him or herself. Um, as we said, they often feel guilty about thinking about their own health or well-being or they feel um, bad about taking time for themselves, or they feel like there are just too many demands and there isn't time or space to attend to their own wellness. But you can really do a wonderful thing for your support partner by encouraging their wellness efforts, by making it possible for them to carve out that time uh, to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. You can support them in their healthy habits. Again, you can think about healthy eating together or quitting smoking together um, or working on other aspects of your wellness like getting those uh, visits into primary care providers and getting your, your general checkups. You can encourage each other to do that. You as a person living with MS can also encourage self-time for your support partner. They may not feel okay to do that without your um, encouragement. If you pay attention to your own safety, you use the equipment and mobility aids that help to keep you safe and independent, you're also doing a great thing for your support partner's wellness because he or she won't have to be worried all the time um, that you're safe. Uh, not at risk of falling and, and hurting yourself. So think about ways that you can take charge of your own safety. And identify some activities that you can enjoy on your own. Um, each individual in a partnership needs to be able to enjoy time alone as well as time together. And if you've had to give up some hobbies or activities that you used to do in the past, think about exploring some new ones that you've never tried before things that you can enjoy and find uh, sustaining and stimulating uh, while your partner is out doing the things that are important for his or her wellness. And think about the slide that Mandy showed because the, the use of mobility aids can really enable the two of you to do things together, to get that recreational activity built back into your lives um, so you can enjoy time together while, while being very active. When you have mutual support for wellness, everybody in the family really benefits. Agreed. So when those partnerships thrive, when both people are healthy and well, 
So that mutual respect for prioritizing wellness will help strengthen those relationships. Um, partners can have fun planning wellness activities. You know, this can encourage greater success when you're having fun with achieving both individual goals and goals that you might have together as a partnership. Maybe it's uh, going on a vacation or doing some type of outdoor activity together. But that more balanced partnership is certainly more intimate, satisfying, and mutually supportive, especially if wellness goals are uh, prioritized and then achieved. So you and your partner can really take charge of your wellness, and we hope that this webinar has a bit of a, bit of a springboard for you to start thinking about that. So that being said, we want to conclude with just two additional polling questions. This one's for support partners. What wellness domain would you like to focus on first? It looks like physical health is taking the lead. As a physical therapist, that just is so exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> Well, I'm not a physical therapist, I'm a psychologist, but I have to agree because I think that really is the basis for everything else, that when you attend to your physical health and feel as good as you can feel it, it, it will help your emotional well-being and it will also uh, set you up better to work on these other areas of your wellness. So I fully, um, I fully support all this attention to physical health and well-being as long as you don't neglect the rest, particularly your emotional health. Well said, Roz. And then people living with MS, what wellness domain would you like your partner to work on first? So now we want the people with MS to comment on the needs for their partner. Again, it appears like physical health dominates the and emotional well-being, both of those two. Wonderful. Well, we do hope this has um, encouraged some additional thought about wellness for all of you. We'd like to thank you for participating and for all of your attention. At this point, we'd like to open up for some, some questions and comments. No comments about the photograph, please. <laughs> <laughs> Mandy and Ross, first of all, thank you so much for such great tips and tools to use um, as a support partner. Um, I did get a number of questions from the participants. The first um, comment that I'd like to, to ask to Roz is my husband was diagnosed two years ago and he doesn't like to talk about it and he is angry at times. I don't know what to do or not to do. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. We have so much stress in our lives. Can you give me some advice? Well, that's a big and very, very important question. Um, and I, I, I want to add to Mandy's comment from before that we actually have webinars um, in the library about communication which may, which may be helpful. You know, I think when, when a diagnosis is relatively new and even one or two years which may feel endless to you can still feel like a short time for a person who's newly diagnosed, um, it, it takes time um, to do the grieving over that life change and to figure out what the next steps are going to be. I really encourage people um, if they can't talk with their loved ones about those feelings, um, to reach out to a, a counselor or mental health professional who's familiar with MS. It can be a really good way to just sort through one's feelings and sort of get your head um, around this unexpected change in your life so that you can uh, move forward. And I, I, I know it's hard to reach out for that kind of help if you've never done it before, but I can tell you that um, it can make a huge difference. I also need to say that the risk of depression in people with MS is extremely high, even as a first symptom of MS. 
this uh, depression is known to be a very common, one of the most common symptoms of MS. And sometimes it, that can set in very early, and it's not something that you should feel you have to handle on your own. It really needs to be um, dealt with if that's something that's going on. So my recommendation would be to think about talking to somebody outside um, for some professional help. Mandy, I'm going to start this with you. Um, and since we're talking about newly diagnosed, the question is, my husband just got diagnosed, and I need to know the top five most important things I should focus and not focus on in order to support him best in his diagnosis. Wow. Um, well, it would depend on what the particular challenges are. If, uh, I'm assuming there might be some, some physical challenges. So if there are physical challenges, I would really encourage them to, to consult with a physical therapist who has some expertise in multiple sclerosis. And I know Roz um, brought up that number, 1-800-FIGHT-MS. And you can call that number, speak with an MS navigator, and ask for a referral, um, or, I'm sorry, ask for some names of people, physical therapists who specialize in multiple sclerosis. And then the PT can turn around and prioritize what physical aspects need attention and how the support person can help with that. Um, and and that's, that's the physical therapist's role and that's their job. So that needs to be something that they can prioritize and really help you problem solve um, versus you having to shoulder that bur burden completely independently on her own. And I guess I'd like to add to that 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 seems like a really important conversation to have with your husband. Um, to sit down together and, and think about what are the things that concern you the most, what questions do you have, how is this impacting your life from day to day. You mentioned that there's a lot of stress and stuff going on. But identify together um, the five different things that seem to be needing your attention the most. Um, and then once you've identified them, um, again, you can call that 1-800 number to talk to an MS navigator. They're all very trained um, individuals who can help you sort out um, what resources you need to tap to deal with the five things on your list. Um, but those five things are going to be different for every person. And so working on them together and identifying what they are, I think, is a really good way to start. Thank you, Roz. And I know earlier we talked about maintaining a balanced relationship. And a lot of questions have come up about relationships in general. This one specifically addressed, my partner is afraid of committing to me because of my disease. Do you have any, um, any suggestions about um, commitment and, and relationships when you do have a diagnosis of MS? So this is Roz, and I'll start on that one. I, I think um, the uncertainty and unpredictability that comes with MS can be terrifying for the person who has it, as well as for anybody who cares about that individual. And I, um, I think the good news is that um, your partner is able to voice that concern and worry. Um, and again, uh, you know, this is my bias because I am a mental health professional, but I think it can be extremely helpful for the two of you to sit down together with a person uh, who's professionally trained to deal with this to help you figure out what the fears are, what you could do to, to mitigate those fears, um, what do you need to learn about the disease, what resources do you need to become familiar with, um, because it's only through talking through the fears in a little more detail, um, you'll be able to figure out if this can possibly work or not. Um, many people um, begin and maintain very, very satisfying relationships and partnerships in spite of MS, um, and some people find that it's just too difficult and, and, and challenging to do, but if you don't talk it through, um, to figure out what the worries are. It's hard to, hard to make a decision and know what your next steps are. Terrific. Thank you so much, Roz. I'm going to um, ask Mandy to start with this one. The question is, as my husband becomes less physically able, he refuses to be on board with modifying our home for handicap access. I believe he feels he has given into the disease if he, 
if he asked for us to help him. Can you give any suggestions to um, someone who is dealing with a, a person with MS that doesn't want to address the, the issues of their disease? Yeah, that's, a, that's challenging. I think um, anytime there's change or progression in the disease, it's extremely, there's a period of kind of mourning those losses and those changes and then trying to come to the, come to the conclusion that there needs to be problem solving and adaptation and figuring out a way to, to, to move forward. So, you know, I think there's a number of strategies that could be employed here. I think first and foremost would be to hopefully identify and help encourage this person to realize that these are tools, that these are tools. Start with small steps. Maybe pick one small adaptation that could be done in the home. Allow that person to utilize that and encourage that person to utilize that positively. And then hopefully that will kind of be like the gateway that will maybe allow them to realize that, hey, this tool isn't so bad. Maybe this small kitchen adaptation or this little tool that I can, this grab bar that I use in the bathroom really, really does kind of help. You know, that wasn't so bad. Now I'm using the grab bar so I'm able to stand and, and use the restroom independently and I don't have to require assistance. So again, if those tools can be presented in such a way that would allow the person to feel greater independence, um, then usually there's greater success and a greater openness to, to those types of devices. Um, but again, I, I wouldn't encourage the support partner to shoulder all of the burden for encouraging those, those changes to happen. I would really encourage the both of them to, you know, to consult with rehab and, and get rehabilitation on board and really explore all of the options that are appropriate and necessary. And I think there are two other things that might might help with this. Uh, I, I believe you you mentioned that your husband would see this as giving into the disease, or you think that that may be his perception. But I think when people can reframe the thought for themselves that this that using tools and strategies um, to be safe and independent and comfortable. Um, is not giving into the disease. It's actually taking charge of the disease. You wouldn't try to build a house without any tools um, or take care of the yard without any tools. And uh, this is a way of taking charge of the MS. So that's one thought. The other thing is that using tools and adaptations isn't just for the person with MS, but the entire family benefits. Um, they don't have to worry as much about safety they, you can engage in more activities together um, the way you used to. And so these are tools for the whole family, not just for the person with MS. Thank you, Roz. Roz, I'm going to direct this to you. Um, unfortunately, we've seen that a number of children have been diagnosed recently with MS. So this um, participant wrote in and said, my 14-year-old daughter was diagnosed with relapsing MS this past October. There are so many emotions, fearful, angry, tired, overwhelmed, useless, and grateful. We were advised to be cautious in sharing her diagnosis outside of the immediate family. And so only besides our immediate family, a few key people know our enormous secret. So it is an enormous secret that we all carry around. Can you give us some tips on how to handle this? Uh, well, I, I, it's hard for me to answer that without knowing why that advice was given. I actually think that um, my advice would be somewhat different. I think it's very, very important for the school and everybody involved at the school to know um, what your daughter's dealing with so that they can make sure to give her the support or adaptations that uh, she might need to be as successful as she can. Um, socially, academically, and every other wise at school. So um, I think uh, sharing the information um, is very important at school. I think also one of the most important things is that no adult or child should feel in any way um, ashamed uh, of this. And when something is kept as a secret, that somehow implies that um, it's you know, a bad thing. So uh, what we say to adults 
uh, in the workplace, for example, is if you have no visible symptoms um, and nothing that impacts your job, we don't encourage you to rush out and tell your employer because you never know how an employer is going to respond. And so maybe that's why the advice was given for your daughter that she has no visible symptoms and so nobody needs to know. But we know that cognitive changes are common in kids, uh, more common perhaps than in adults. And we just want to make sure that if she's having any challenges with memory or thinking that, that might impact her schoolwork, that that she's getting the support she needs at school. So I, I, I guess overall I would say that secrecy may not be um, the most effective strategy in a situation like this. Thank you. Raj, I have another question for you. Um, the question is, again, regarding relationships. How can my wife and I keep a positive marriage going when she feels the pressure of caregiving full time? Well, I think it depends what the words pressure of caregiving mean. Um, so it, it, it's again about communication. What is it that, that the, those pressures mean to her? What's involved? Does she have to be doing all of that herself? Is she taking on more than she absolutely has to? Um, can you do more for yourself or for her so that things feel more balanced? Would the use of more tools or assistive devices um, help so that she feels um, like she is able to do more with you instead of for you? Are there any resources to put toward bringing anyone else in to help with some of the responsibilities around the house, for example? So it's really a conversation about what those pressures and stresses are and then looking at each one of them to see if there's any, any other resource you could bring to bear that would relieve some of that for her. Um, also, in line with the whole program tonight, what could be done to ensure that there's some cards out time for your wife to uh, enjoy some activities on her own, take care of her own wellness um, so that she's getting what she needs in terms of her own self-care as well as what she's doing um, to care for you. Thank you, Roz. Um, I'm going to throw this out and either Roz or Mandy can answer it. Um, one of our participants asked, when I try to have the person with MS that I'm supporting take care of the responsibilities such as phone calls, etc., she often doesn't remember to do them. And then they are back on my plate. So there are any suggestions on helping them remember what they said they would do? Maybe I'll let you go ahead, that? Roz. If you... Okay, well, I'll start. But uh, you know, I think when, when we talk about sharing tasks, um, we, we need to think carefully about the, the things that the person with MS can do or is challenged to do. If memory is challenging, that doesn't mean that uh, the person can't do those tasks, but, but they might need to set it up differently so that um, they remember what they need to do. So you can use a family calendar where things are listed. Um, or you can use a smartphone with reminders on it, or simple lists at the beginning of the day that get checked off when things are done. So, um, without knowing more specifically what the challenges are, it's you know it's hard to give specific recommendations. But I think an, uh, an occupational therapist or speech and language pathologists, many of them uh, do work on cognitive remediation and you could uh, work with somebody who could help set up uh, some templates or some tools to make it possible for your loved one to do those things that are, that are challenged by memory problems. I would agree. I would echo Roz's comments, but I would also add um, the importance of of identifying those tasks which the person with MS can be successful at. I think Roz kind of uh, touched on that a bit. So perhaps reevaluating what um, roles and responsibilities can be shared 
and then making sure that that person with MS can be, can be successful at them. And then that would benefit both, both the partner as well as the person living with MS. Thank you, Mandy. So we have time for one more question, which I'm going to direct to, to Mandy to start with. And then I'm going to give um, both Mandy and Roz the opportunity to, get, to provide some closing comments. So Mandy, the question to you is the support partner said, flip the question around. What if the support partner does not want adaptations made to their home? He doesn't want the house to look like a disabled person who lives there. Any suggestions? Yes, consult with a really good um, construction individual, a really good contractor, somebody who truly does understand um, how to make the home accessible, so wider doorways, um, making things look attractive, but at the same time um, easily accessible, so a good contractor. Um, as far as a resource for that, Roz, do you think the society would have a list of of contractors? I don't know if they necessarily do. I know the local ones here in Nebraska. Um, other than that, I would just encourage that per this person to either ask their neurologist, ask their PT, ask any of kind of the local MS groups that um, you may be associated with of any contractors in the area that are um, exceptional with remodeling. So I, I think that, that that's a great answer, and I think there are ways for a home to be very attractive and uncluttered even when the house is made adaptable. But I, I think it's also important to have a conversation about how to make the home safe and comfortable for everybody who lives there. And the person who's living with a disability is in the house and is a member of the family. And so how can that house be what it needs to be attractive and safe um, for everybody who's there? And that may be a conversation that you might need to have with a family counselor um, just to figure out um, how each of you can end up with the home that you want and need um, even though there has to be some adaptation in it because you don't, we don't ever want a person living with a disability to, to become a prisoner in their home or in one room of the house because the rest of the home isn't accessible. Um, and we don't want people to be in danger uh, because one bad fall um, can do a lot of, of damage. So I encourage you to try and have a conversation with each other about how to meet both your needs in your home together. Thank you, Roz. Now I'm going to go back to Mandy and ask, Mandy, do you have any closing comments before we finish up tonight's webinar? Um, other than just thank you all for your attention, your participation. These uh, questions have been phenomenal. And thank you, Roz, for your expertise and for um, Laura for your moderation. This has been a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Roz? Well, I certainly echo that. Um, I always enjoy doing webinars with Mandy. Um, and I think the questions were, were absolutely terrific. But mostly I'm, I'm thrilled that, that you came together, you individuals living with MS and your support partners came together to this webinar to learn about wellness because uh, it's important for both of you um, to be taking as, as good care of yourselves as you possibly can so that you can be good partners for each other. And I wish you the best. Thank you, Roz, and thank you, Mandy. Right now I would like to inform you of some additional resources that you may find informative and helpful. On the Kendu MS website, mscandu.org, you will find archived webinars, e-news, and library articles, including an article, Tips for Support Partners, Taking Care of Yourself while caring for your loved one. That was written by Roz and Mandy. You can also submit a question to the Ask the Can Do team, which will be answered by our team of MS experts. Additional resources can be found through the National MS Society. They publish a wide range of literature, including a guide for caregivers. Please visit nationalmssociety.org for this and other resources provided by the National MS Society. The next presentation in our webinar and telelearning series will be on Tuesday, November 8th at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Diet and Multiple Sclerosis, a Neurologist Perspective. This is an opportunity to look at how certain dietary factors are linked to the risk of developing MS, as well as to helping manage symptoms, 
treatment options, and improve overall health. As always, you can register for the webinar and telelearning series free of charge on the CanDo MS website, mscando.org. And one final note, please complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the conclusion of this web webinar. Thank you all, and have a great night. <laughs>